Hey guys, Harv here, and welcome back to the Kerbal Space Program. This is not the start of a new series, this is simply one video in many parts, because it took over four hours. This one mission took over four hours. And yes, we are going to go pay homage to the dead Space Kraken, or maybe one of its children, we never know. But, um... As you will all know, or most of you will know, I did a live stream last night with Le Goldfish was hosting it, and we also had Ryan the Solar Gamer, we had uh, Matt Dennis was on it at one point, it was a massive charity live stream, and we succeeded in raising over 1,260 US dollars, which equates to about 800 pounds, so we did a lot of good work there. And uh, it was a 24 hour charity live stream, so <laughs> Goldfish stayed awake for actually 26 hours it went on for. Um, I sadly did not. Uh, bo both because A, I need sleep. I am, um, you know, I like sleep. It's quite a nice thing. But also because I have parents who won't appreciate me talking throughout the entirety of the night. Um, Yes, what are we doing here? We're going to uh, go visit the Space Kraken, and what do we need in order to do that? Well, none other than a rover, of course. This is the assembly. The, uh, the second episode will be testing, where we're going to actually take this to Minmus. The third episode will be... Uh, what was the third episode? Oh yeah, third episode will be landing on Bop, uh, where the Dead Space Kraken is. Fourth episode will be driving on Bop, which is going to take a while, and the fifth episode, uh, which did take a while in fact, and the fifth episode will be returning to Kerbin safely. If, if I manage to survive, it is a daring task, certainly one not to be taken by a fool. Um, yes, I, I, I'm, go I'm going to talk to you about the assembly in this first video. Now I wouldn't usually want the assembly to be a video in its own right, but I think this qualifies because A, it took me long enough, uh, probably, what, 40, yeah, 40 minutes this one, uh, this assembly section took, uh, but this also includes testing, as we are about to see now. So yes, I it's actually pretty funny in some cases, I, I seem to remember it is at least. Um, so yes, I, I thought I'd keep it in because I like to document the entire uh, the entire process of doing this mission. And I was talking to my parents earlier about how I just finished recording a four hour mission. <laughs> or over four hours. Oop, there we go, that's the first funny bit. Um, over four hours, seeing as I didn't actually record the entirety of it, not the boring bits. Um, and yeah, uh, they, they didn't reply positively, like, oh, why did you spend over four hours on your computer? But, um, I did mention that I thought it's very this this mission is very representative of the game really. Um, I don't know why. I mean, it includes flying and driving. Although driving isn't exactly re representative, it's still you know a good part of the game. Um, making rovers and things, and it includes doing docking and rendezvous, uh, interplanetary travel, landing on moons. Uh, testing, blowing things up, flying, breaking things. It's very much a Kerbal mission, which is good. I think that's great. And to what, what can make it possibly more Kerbal than having Jebediah Kerman as our pilot throughout? Yes. Um, right, right now we're just driving this rover around, testing it. Uh, you can see we passed the VAB and there's the uh, Command Pod Mark 1 memorial there. Ah, I wonder how many of my subscribers used to play back when the command pod was was had three kerbals in it and it was the only one and all that. I started playing the game point eleven, I seem to remember, and then I probably I probably uh I properly started playing about point thirteen or so. Oh yeah, let's see if we can make this go up a ramp and jump it and no. <laughs> I like it just slices off the front wheels. And it's absolutely brilliant. Um yeah, I I just need to test out to see how well this thing works. Um, if I actually, and yeah, there we go. So the method, the method behind the madness is that the rover is constructed around the central fuel tank and engine, uh, which can break away and go flying and rendezvous in orbit. Obviously I won't be able to do it in curve in orbit, but I'm hoping at this stage that on BOP it will have enough delta V. Um, now what I'm thinking is that oh, I should probably probably have some fuel reserves, to be honest. I mean, there are circumstances under which I might want to use uh, 
the LV99 engine during the rover section, which it turns out I do. <laughs> so it might be a good idea to try and put some liquid fuel on the side. Um, obviously I can't put it there, Harvey, because that's where the RCS thrusters are. There looks a bit weird for some reason, um, and I can't really put it on the sides either. I mean, I could just put it like that, I suppose that works. That makes it a bit further out than I would personally like. Um, we could use toroidal tanks. That might be an idea, Harvey. But let's test this first of all, just to see. So these, these are, those outside liquid tanks actually don't feed into the main engine. Uh, but when, uh, you can use, seeing as it's attached, you can use fuel transfer just to move things around a little. Um, yeah, so the design as it currently stands, we have four RCS tanks, which is way more than we need, but it's still, I, I don't think it's overkill. It's more than we need, but it's definitely not overkill, actually. Uh, let's drive over here, because, hey, <laughs> why not? Uh, and I actually want to test out using the engine in conjunction with the rover. So if I turn on the engine, uh, this is for sharp turning, uh, under emergencies of course, if I turn it on, I should be able to just spin around rather quickly. Oh no, actually, first of all, demonstrate the fuel transfer. So if I use some of it in the emergency, I can always just take it out of these side tanks. It's pretty good, but there's not really all that much fuel in those side tanks, so I'm not sure how worthwhile it is. Uh, yes, we will be upgrading to toroidal aerospikes. Uh, toroidal fuel tanks, which contain twice as much, if I remember rightly, about twice as much. There we go, if I lift that up, then I will be able to turn rather quickly, which seems pretty useful on Kerbin, but on Bop, where the gravity is so low and there's no atmosphere, yeah, it's not really necessary. In fact, the engine's only really used under, emergency, under emergencies to prevent us from crashing or whatnot. Try and spin around, having the brakes on, I discover, uh, it actually won't lift it fully off the ground, so you need to have the brakes off in order to let the wheels slide around. <laughs> spin that rocket! But yeah, that's a... Uh, I think it pretty much works, and despite using so much fuel, we can in fact detach and go a little way up in the air before coming straight back down. Sorry Jeb, I'm afraid you're going to die. Or not. Wow. Jeb is one hell of a pilot. <laughs> okay, back to the actual construction. We have the rover, but I am going to swap those out for toroidal fuel tanks, and the main reason actually is aesthetic. Look, it's like a, a nice barrel kind of thing, it fits inside it, uh, clipping admittedly, but it does fit inside and gives it a nice barrel kind of feel to the rover. Uh, just like to mention here that the music in the background is hilarious because it's sped up to two times speed. <laughs> As the entire video is, I decided to keep the music in for once. I like it, it's quite nice. Um, yeah, do we want the communicatrons? Nah, they stick out a little, and to be honest, they don't have a use. Um, so they're not really all that important. But of course, instruments which don't have a use, they are important, obviously. <sighs> So we can slot them on the tanks just there, tilt it up, nice and convenient spacing for them. And there we go, We're putting on our negative gravioli, <laughs> or whatever, or the puns and the description the names are. Ah, brilliant. Love that. You can have so much entertainment just by reading each part. So, that's it, pretty much. Let's work on the next stage. I actually want to land this thing using a lander, surprisingly enough, and then the rover will just hop off using its LV-99 or RCS, and that'll be all fine and dandy. Thinking at the start off with, I was thinking, I should probably have some stronger legs. Um, I don't mean in real life, of course, I mean in the game. My legs in real life are pretty strong, pretty lean and fit. But, um, Yes, put put those legs on there. Uh, we don't need the big ones, they're too tall. And then trying the medium-sized ones, they're also too tall. But if I put a connector there, then they won't be too tall. Look at that. Perfect. And I can even put another one there to have a li uh, another set there, just to have a bit more stability. However, I do want to incorporate advanced SAS somewhere into this design. Um, actually, come to think of it. I remember now what happened with the rover, and um, yeah, I would have liked to have advanced SES a bit further up, but no matter. We can um, put a big docking port to replace that up there, because hey, it's stronger. <laughs> it's always good to have a bit less wobble. So yeah, put the advanced SES on there. 
bit slowed down in retrospect, um, but that is pretty much the land assorted, just legs and the fuel tank and an engine and decoupler and what more could you want? Shall we actually work on the interplanetary stage? I think that's a rather important bit, we definitely can't afford to forget about that. So let's take all this and uh, put some parachutes on the side, although although I think I'd prefer to put parachutes on the top bit of the rover actually because my reasoning being it's a very small section that I'm intending to bring back to Kerbin, the part of the rover that detaches and flies away after dropping those outside wheels and RCS tanks and all that. Um, so it's already a small lean thing and it's probably going to be too much hassle fitting another decoupler into the interplanetary stage that we are building right now. So. Uh, those outside fuel tanks, a bit too big there, Harvey. Maybe one quarter of the size, that's a bit better, isn't it? At this point I'm doubting I'll have enough fuel, but... I don't know, my confidence varies as we go through the mission, uh, which is always nice, I think. If you know for sure something won't work, there's no element of stress, which is what makes management games so fun. Putting s some struts on to make the entire design a bit more rigid. Uh, there we go, I think that's just fine. And obviously we actually want to use the fuel inside this tank, so it might be a handy idea just to feed some fuel lines through there. Put a big decoupler on and we'll work on our launch stage. Uh, there we go, move the entire ship up a little. I think it's looking pretty good. I think it has looked pretty good so far. Um, there are definitely going to be a few more things to change about the design. Namely RCS on that central detaching stage because we, um, we're actually going to be docking back with the ship. As I said, I want to bring it home. Um, so we're leaving that interplanetary stage in orbit and we're going down with the rover and back up with this central part. So it might be useful to, you know, put the parachutes on it and check its centre of mass. Um, it seems to be around there, but plussing fuel tanks, or adding on some fuel tanks, that will actually lower the centre of mass somewhat. Uh, if we go to the tab and to them and put them down, you can see it brings it just a bit down. We probably only need two fuel tanks, actually. There we go. Um, so, uh, despite the fact that, actually, despite putting those fuel tanks on, those thrusters are pretty much in the correct place. And I think there's enough room for them to be put exactly where they are on the actual rover. So we'll load up the rover again, uh, go back into this stage and put those fuel tanks on there. Going straight through a strut, and that's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> oh well, who cares? I mean, I've already done enough clipping, already broken enough rules about the laws of physics with uh, clipping those RCS tanks inside the struts, but my argument is that the struts are built around the tanks, because in real life, that would make sense, you know? So why not exploit it in a game? God. There we go, I've added those onto the rover, and that's all fine and dandy. Uh, what else do we want to do now? Put a probe there! Always a good idea. Bits that you are intending to use later, but you're leaving unmanned. It's generally a good idea to put probes on there. Despite the fact that we'd have to put some nuclear generators on the side to uh, actually power it, I think it's fine. I mean, I could have used solar panels which are lighter, but then again, going around the dark side of the planets, you know, breaking them off, all sorts of problems as a result of that. Uh, going for my Hawk Gaming standard trademark launch profile here, launch stage, excuse me, um, excuse me both for the mistake and for the burp there, the very subtle, subtle burp that you probably didn't hear that I've just drawn attention to. There we go. So the inside, inside stack is going to be simply few, uh, two fuel tanks and an engine. And the outside stack is going to be a bit of an upgrade, having three fuel tanks and an engine. My my my, we are getting very advanced here, aren't we? Putting some struts around, you can never have enough struts. More struts, less boosters. Going against the... against the, what Kerbal Space Program basically stands for. You know, more boosters. Anyone? No? Okay. Oh yeah, let's put some struts across the centre. That'll be fine, surely. Makes it more integral. What about that engine that's dangling above your head? Ah, it'll be fine. I mean, come on, there's a gap in the middle for the fuel to go through, and it'll be fine. I mean, it's the Kerbal Space Program, of course, is going to be fine. We'll need some fuel going in from there to the main tank. Uh, it doesn't have to actually physically attach uh, due to the textures and the collision mass being out of line. 
something I think the game might want working on. Uh, but anyhow, certainly not a pressing, pressing issue. I'd rather they work on more rover parts, which would make this job easier, wouldn't it? A. Hey. Um, oh yeah, I'm getting some weird bugs with struts as well. Uh, it seems to be dangling in mid-air a little, but no matter. Easy enough to fix, certainly. Uh, just plop them back on. And my preview is freezing up. Man, it's been a while since I've had this problem. So I'm actually commentating blind currently, which is fine because, you know, I'm a rambler. Uh, I am a professional Kerbal Space Program YouTube rambler. So I can pretty much just carry on talking to myself and pretending to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's what I tend to do. We've got like four hours to actually go through um, in order to provide you with the necessary entertainment. Oh yes, in the in the live stream, I promised that if we went over one thousand two hundred dollars, I would do uh, four videos in one day. And lo and behold, this is the first of five because hey, I'm feeling generous. However, I did phrase it that I would make four videos in one day. Uploading four videos in one day—that's a different matter. It's not going to happen because a. The way YouTube works means that they won't all go to your subscription page, so you'll miss most of them, which is bad for me, it's bad for you, it's a no-win situation. Uh, and B, I don't have the internet bandwidth to upload that many videos in one day. Plus, it, oh, come on, space it out, makes sense, you know? Um, but yes, making four videos, four videos in one day, certainly, uh, uploading them is quite a different matter. I think by now we're probably on the staging section. Uh, still commentating blind, although I have got a lagged preview, that's absolutely fine. Uh, probably quite a few number of minutes behind by now, but no matter. Um, so yes, sort out the staging and all that. Uh, taking a look at the fuel lines, just making sure, making sure that they are in fact leading in the correct direction. And upon a quick, ex a quick inspection, I think they are. That's pretty much it, if, uh, if the preview is anything to go by. What else do we need to do? Action groups. Action groups are always a good thing to do, aren't they? Yes. The um, This mission, it was fun, but painful at the same time. I, I've told you that there was about four hours of footage recorded. Uh, I think two and a half hours of that was actually on Bop itself, looking for the damn cracker. <laughs> uh, no matter. We shall carry on. Forge onwards, as they say. As I say, I don't think anyone else actually says that anymore. Where are we? Where are we in the video? Memory does not serve. The cloud of memory is rather, rather thick in this portion of the video. Either memory or just having a terrible editor, but never mind. Um, what I usually do, actually, to avoid this problem is I render out the video. But if I'm going to make five videos in one day, I don't have time to render out the entire video only so I can commentate over it. I'm using Camtasia Studio 7. Oh, that's the end of the video, sorry, a bit late. Um, yes, next video is coming very soon, but not today. Um, <laughs> yeah, using Camtasia Studio 7 usually allows me to actually uh, render, uh, speed it up without needing to render it out, but no matter. Uh, thank you very much for watching, if you liked the video, please do like the video. And I'll see you all next time.